Okay. Looks like the stream is good. All right, we're live. All right, so let's go. Um, thank you to everybody that showed up and everybody that is going to be at some point, hopefully watching this in the future. Uh, the purpose of this, this is actually part one of, I have no idea how many streams, but the purpose here is to go through building a DQN example with PyTorch. And outside of using PyTorch for the neural network representation and uh, training, as well as using OpenAI Gym for the environment, everything else I want to do from scratch. And I also don't want this to be what somebody, <clears throat> I was reading through comments on a Sentex video, and somebody was talking about how a lot of uh, tutorials of this nature are sterile, that um, they're kind of smoothed over. You don't see a lot of the mistakes and stuff like that. And so I want these streams to at least serve as a basis for a video that I might edit later that isn't sterile. So if I make mistakes, if I have to debug, I want all of that to be part of the video, part of the stream. And um, yeah, so that's sort of, that's, a, that's an important bit. And the, the, another bit that's important for this video and uh, you know, for the stream and whatever videos might follow <clears throat> is uh, I keep seeing these repeated posts on uh, various machine learning subreddits where it's always the same thing. Somebody's coming here there to ask a question like, hey, I, I set up a DQN. It seemed to be working fine on a simple environment. And then I went to a more complicated environment. Usually it's Pong or Breakout. And all of a sudden, I, I can't tell if it's working. It doesn't seem to be learning. I don't know what to do. And it's like, it's kind of hard to help those people without understanding their situation more. Oh, very often, it ends up being that they're not training long enough. But there's obviously a disconnect between people learning to do this stuff and learning to diagnose issues and go through, you know, the various metrics that they can see and also understand sort of what are what are the expectations? How long should it take for you to train in Pong? So I also want this stream to have uh, somewhat of a, like th that kind of, a, that kind of information in it, in it as well. Okay, so let's get going, enough talking. Um, now, the first thing that I'm going to do is actually going to be uh, getting the simple OpenAI environment. And one of the funniest things is I've, I've been doing reinforcement learning for close to two months now. And I actually haven't used a stock OpenAI gym environment. I've uh, I've either built my own and I, or I've used VizDoom, which, but none of the stock ones. So um, I'm a, a little new here to this. But usually, the simple example that everybody goes with is cart pull, right? And the simple cart pull, at least, you're not learning from pixels. You have, as I believe, the angle and maybe the velocity. So looking through this example, so yeah, we can, we can go ahead and take this code. I have, I have an environment set up with Jim and uh, PyTorch and everything, so... Let's just start messing with the cart pole, make sure that um, make sure that we have sort of everything that we need before we actually launch into the coding. Uh, Maxerator DQN, uh, it's just it just stands for DeepQ network. Uh, it's just like a, the standard term for <clears throat> uh, deep Q learning, essentially. So let's go ahead and paste this code that we just got from uh, the gym website. 
let's see, make the environment, reset it, run it, take the observation. Uh, it's not doing a render step, and I kind of want to see. Or is it doing a render step? No, it's just doing step. Yeah, so let's import time. And, uh, oh, no, it is doing a render step. Um, but I want it to sleep, so time.sleep, zero point. Let's do one because I kind of want to see how this goes. Uh, work on RL, run the test. Okay, so this is the, the basic environment, and it's just taking random steps, and it looks like if the angle goes above a certain point, um, the game stops. So that's, I guess that's the failure mode. Da, da, da. So let's put an IPDB in there because I'm also not quite fully familiar with some of these, uh, like how to get the information about the action space and everything. So I'm going to put an IPDB here. And put up the terminal sort of front and center. Okay, let's get the environment here. Okay, so n dot action space. What are you? Oh, okay. It just tells you. Oh, okay. So this is how you figure out how many different actions are possible. And then you can sample from it. It just gives you a number. Cool. So we take the action and then end dot step. That's fairly normal. Uh, when, what does it put in info? It's just an empty dict, I guess. Maybe it's filled when the game finishes. We'll find out. Um, and then done is just a bool. In this case, false. And then reward. Oh, right. So in this game, I guess the reward is uh, plus one for every plus one for every step survived. And then negative one for failing, I think. Uh, I guess I can look at more information about the environment. The goal is to prevent it from falling over. A reward of plus one is applied. Episode ends when the pole is more than 15 degrees from vertical. Or the cart moves more than 2.4 units away from the center. Okay, so it also can't move too far. Okay, cool. All right, uh, what does the observation look like? The observation. The observation is four numbers. What are these numbers? I, I guess it doesn't actually matter from the perspective of, that's the whole point of a model-free method, but I still would like to know what the observation means. Our environments. This is gonna give me the same information again. Um, gym cart pole observation. Oh, okay. It's an issue on OpenAI's GitHub. Position of cart, velocity of cart, angle of pole, and rotation rate of pole. So. Position, velocity, angular position, angular velocity. Cool. Not that this matters, again, because model-free. So all the network is supposed to figure this out. Okay, so good. Um, no, not good, because I still, I there's a way that you can access this information. Observation space, box four. Okay, so then I can just get... Uh, Okay, yeah. So now I have all the information that I would need um, working through the DQN. So that was just a little bit of an aside, um, just going over OpenAI Gym and the, the environment that we're going to be dealing with. Cool. Okay, I'm going to leave this here. Um, I guess I can take some notes here. 
So n dot action space dot n to get number of actions and then n dot observation space dot shape to get shape of observation. A tautology is a tautology. Okay, um, what did I just do? Okay, so let's see how we want to do it. So this, this is done. So put together model class. Um, I actually want to change this to an actor class. Because uh, oftentimes I've seen people lay this out as a class that can take an arbitrary model, um, has all the information about the environment, and then uh, sort of represents the actor itself. So we'll, we'll do the model class separately, and we'll do the actor class separately. Um, so these can actually go under this step. And then for the actor class, um, yeah, so, so yeah, so I guess the model class should not, it, it should not worry about the target model. That should be part of the agent. The network for pass train step. All of these should be handled by the model. This abstraction makes sense. And then for the actor class, it should, it should probably be responsible of sampling action um, during training or just in general. Uh, it should be responsible for target model update. Um, it should be responsible for the epsilon, I think. Um, I think that's that's it. Um, okay, so a little bit of additional context. Uh, NCAP, uh, there's a question about, I, I knew this was going to come up. I knew this was going to come up. Uh, <laughs> there's a question about why I'm not using i3 um, or why I'm not using F XFCE. Um, this, is my, this is my home desktop that up until this point has only been used for gaming on Windows, unfortunately. Uh, and I recently set it up with the uh, Manjuro and I don't use it directly very often. So I, I remote into it. Uh, and because I was working with the uh, reinforcement learning, oftentimes I needed to see the windows and i3 is not very conducive to sort of visual remote desktop. Uh, so that, so I, le I left the standard GNOME environment. So this is actually just GNOME, it's not even i3. Um, I'm gonna set it up, like if I keep using it for streams, I'll probably set up i3 on it, but for now it's just GNOME. And that plays well with TeamViewer, which is what I use for remoting. Okay, so let's see, we are, yeah, a good 14 minutes in and I haven't done any coding. So <laughs> let's let's fix that. So uh, agent.py. Yeah, thanks for asking. I'm... The concern about me using uh, inferior uh, windowing systems is uh, touching. Oh, right, before before actual coding, I'm gonna derail myself again. But before actual coding, I should go over some of these, uh, some of these concepts. So, so basically, a DQN is an extension of Q learning, right? Uh, and you have the exact same update equation for like as normal Q learning, but then you kind of sort of modify it for deep learning uh, so that you can use a neural net. So the agent class is obviously going to be responsible for either using the model, which is a stand in for the Q table uh, to sample the next action, given some observation. Um, and then it, it may or may not make sense for it to also handle an epsilon value, which is uh, going to be part of uh, exploration during training. Uh, because we're not just we don't just want to sample whatever the model knows best right now. We also want to um, we we want to have some randomness. So epsilon controls that randomness during training, not during testing. 
Uh, and then the target model is a trick that actually makes deep Q learning work. Uh, without it, deep Q learning actually becomes kind of infeasible. And basically what's happening is it, it's a, the if you just have one neural network and you're using that neural network to train some data and try to uh, sort of try to fit the, you know, the self-consistency condition that the Bellman equation provides you uh, in Q learning, it, it's going to, it's, it's essentially it, it almost metaphorically it's just chasing its own tail, right? It's trying to fit to data that is going to change in the next step because of the, the update, right? Because of the gradient descent. And so the target model is a trick that was developed at DeepMind, as far as I know, <clears throat> where you um, you fit to data that corresponds to a fixed model, and you update that model every so often. You don't update it um, every step. You update it every 5,000 steps or something like that. So that's one of that. And then the replay buffer is another trick that makes deep learning uh, work with reinforcement learning. And uh, the reasoning for that being you usually want a lot of data for deep learning. So instead of saying like, hey, I ran the environment for a few steps, use this for, for training, we keep a very large buffer. It's gonna be something like 100,000 steps or something like that, right? And then we randomly sample for that from for every epoch. So this is sort of the, the context for each of these steps. Okay, enough talking, let's code. So for our agent, what do we want as an input? We said we wanted the agent, or I guess the actor in this case, whatever. Um, so it, it, if it's gonna be sampling action and everything, it needs to it needs to know the size of the action space. It needs to know the size of the action space. Um, so there's a lot of redundant information that's gonna be flying because the model knows the size of the action space. Um, and then the environment already, like the environment, creates the size of the action space. And then the agent knows the size of the size of the action space. Uh, we'll we'll figure it out. I'm, I'm over optimizing too early. So let's just do new actions. Um, I don't think the agent really needs to know the observation space size. It might not even need to know the number of actions actually. Now that I think of it, because if it has the model. Either way, it definitely needs the model. Um, and I'm actually going to say no. It doesn't. Um, let's put some of these questionable things here. So I don't know where epsilon and target model update should go. We'll figure it out. But I don't see it fitting well in the agent abstraction. So let's start simple. The agent only gets the model. That's it. So self.model equals model. And then we can say Yeah, we can just say like act. And we can pass it some observation. Um um, I should specify that this is a DQN agent. Okay, so act, we specify some observation, uh, and then the whole point is that we're gonna apply the model to this observation and get the Q values. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, let's pass the observation. So in this case, Let's take some notes. So the the input shape. Uh, thank you for the question, Manas. Uh, it so from the agent's perspective, it should not matter if the observation is a single frame or a stack of frames. Um, that matters from the mo matters from the model's perspective. Uh, in the simple environment that we're going to tackle, and probably before I get really sleepy and crash tonight. Um, I'm probably only going to be able to do the cart pole. And for a cart pole, a single frame is fine because cart pole defines both the, um, the position, angular position, and then also the velocity, right? And 
usually when you're stacking frames, the velocity is what you're looking for. So if we already have the velocity, we don't need more than one frame. Uh, once we get to breakout, uh, we will need at least two frames, and usually the standard is to use four. But I do want to do a follow-up to this tutorial uh, later on where we restrict ourselves to a single frame and use a recurrent agent. And then sort of have that state be implicitly part of an LSTM or, or a gated recurrent unit. Um, so I'll, I'll tackle that later. I've, I've done that in the Wisdom environment, and it, it does work if you, if you do it that way. Um, and it's kind of cool. Okay. So act. Uh, I just want to take some notes here. So the observation shape um, is going to be... Uh, uh, this needs to work on batches. It, the model expects batches, right? So n would be the batch size, which for, let's say, for a test scenario, is just going to be 1. Um, and then, so I'm, I'm just taking notes for cart pull right now, so it's just before, right, as we know. Um, QVALS is num actions, so uh, the shape of QVALS. Hmm. No, it's fine. <clears throat> so the shape of QLs is going to end up being just n and then the number of actions, which in this case is uh, 2. Yeah. Okay. And this is the... I uh, see I'm abstracting myself into a corner here. Let's, uh, duh, no. So, I'm trying to figure out if the agent should have a reference to the environment and if the agent should be responsible for stepping through the environment or not. Let's say for now, no, and in the future, we might come back and change that. So then the function should not be called act. It should be called get actions and should get observations. Okay, so we get Q values, and then we want to return a list of actions. So Q values in this case is going to be a tensor. A PyTorch tensor. So I think we can just call the max function on it, and we're maxing over the second, um, so just the last, the last axis. So yeah, uh, just don't need to do that. Just return that. What's the time here? Yeah, we took a good 10 minutes to write this. Wonderful. Very efficient. <laughs> okay. So, what is the next class we want? Let's do the model. And the model does explicitly need some of these information. So it needs observation shape, right? We'll, we'll name it something else later, but yeah, once we get to breakout, we're going to need to uh, specify these separately. Okay, so it needs observation shape. It needs the number of actions. Um, let's not give any other arguments for now. Now we actually need to define the model. So uh, usually, given the problem is relatively straightforward, um, people use like a just I think just a couple of couple of dense layers. So let's do standard imports for PyTorch. So this might My autocomplete is not working, so this is going to end up being very, very entertaining. Oh, excuse me. So 
Sorry, I dropped something heavy, as you might have heard. Okay, import torch.nn as an n. Um, import torch.nn.functional, I believe, as f. Doing a lot of this from memory. I should probably start looking at the documentation soon here. Um, let me just check my... Yeah, there's no... I don't know why... I don't know why the autocomplete is not working. Whatever. Um, I'll just look at an example of... Uh, network in PyTorch. Let's see... And then... Ah, there we go. This is a pretty good example. I'm just gonna copy this. Okay. Oh, this needs to... This needs to subclass. If yeah, this needs to subclass. And how do you subclass? I think the 60 minute blitz on the PyTorch website uh, is pretty good. It goes over not not this part though. Um, this training a classifier. And end up module. Okay, so we need to subclass from n n dot module, and then do this. So super model, yeah, self in it. Okay. Eighty percent of programming is just syntax and minutia. It's kind of annoying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we'll we'll come back to doing the forward pass and everything. Cool. Okay. So self dot. I'm just gonna say net. Um. And then. I think just a couple linear layers are probably going to be fine. Uh, the input here is uh, observation shape. It's not observation shape, so I'm actually... Hmm. Let's still leave it as observation shape. Um, and then I can say, just to, because this is meant to be for problems that have a flat observation, so I'm just going to say len uh, oops shape is 1. So. If it's not one, then uh, this network only works for flat observations. Yeah, the number of viewers is steadily going up. Uh, new viewers, uh, please introduce yourselves and chat and talk to me. Um, okay. So now that we know that observation shape should have a length of one, um, we can start designing our fully connected layers. So this is going to be ops shape zero to, I don't know, it's probably something small is going to be fine for this problem. So 256. Um, and then eh, 256 is actually kind of big, but whatever. Um, 256 and then on the other end, we receive 256, and then the output is going to be num actions. And in Q-learning, you wouldn't have uh, you wouldn't have an activation after this. Hey, Michael. Okay. Uh, you wouldn't have an activation after this because the Q value is it's it's a it's the reward. Uh, oh, stream is going blurry. Is stream going blurry for anybody else? Oh, I just saw that 44% of the frames are being dropped. It might be... 
uh, fine for minus. Let me turn down my bitrate anyway, just in case. Because I am dropping frames, apparently. Let's see if that changes anything. I'm also recording this for when I make actually the video. Okay. All right, so this should be sufficient from the perspective of a model. Uh, I, I was talking about how in Q learning you don't have an activation after the final layer because you're trying to represent a real number, right, in terms of the reward. So most activation functions won't really make any sense. Like if you put a ReLU on there, then you can't represent negative rewards, but you, you need to be able to represent negative rewards. So no activations after this. Cool. So the forward pass for this is going to be really, really straightforward. Um, and forward is just, we're just overriding the forward function from PyTorch's nn.module. And in this case, we're just, the model basically is containing inside it another model, which is this uh, sequential object. And uh, we just apply that. So return self dot, oops, self dot net, apply that to x. Okay, cool. So we got all of that. Let's start doing some tests because we've written a fair amount of code without doing any tests and that's bad. So if name equals name, whoops. So let's go ahead and make our environment. I'm just going to copy all of this for now. <laughs> okay. So, gym.make, carpool, fine, get an observation, start a loop. No, oh, I guess I don't actually want the loop. I just want a single step. I don't need to render it for now. No need to sleep. Don't need that. Don't do that. So we already have the observation, so I can actually comment all of that out. And then we want to make, let's say, so an instance of the model. So yeah, and then I'm going to say end dot and then end dot action space dot end. Okay. And then let's do a forward pass on it. So Q vals equals, that's not gonna work, is it? Let's try it, but I think it's gonna fail. Um, M and apply that to the observation. Wow. Okay, cool. So let's run this. Uh, making some mistakes here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So first things first needs to be a tensor. <laughs> that have worked? Um, what is the shape if I say yeah so it just has a shape of four um, created the right output I'm just wondering if uh, if this should have worked. B 
because the first dimension was not the batch dimension. I guess we can do a concatenation. So let's do torch.cat. Nope, that's wrong. Uh, it's stack. Yeah, so now this is a batch of two. Is the model going to work correctly here? Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, I guess I had it wrong. Okay. So forward pass on the model works. So networks put together, forward pass works. We need to add the train step, but before we do the train step, I think we need to tackle the replay buffer. IPDB is definitely a must have. It's like, it's a lifesaver. It's a really, really good tool. Actor class sampling action. Um, yeah, I mean, we already did this, but it's, not necessarily very useful at the moment. Okay, so let's talk about the train step. But okay, before we talk about the train step, we need to talk about the the replay buffer. Okay. Um, and actually, before we talk about the replay buffer, we need to talk about um, the observation itself. So in Q learning. Well, in reinforcement learning, what you're dealing with is usually um, state, action, reward, next state, right? Which spells out SARS, which is, uh, I suppose, relevant to our current predicament. <laughs> Sorry, that feels like dark humor. Um, anyway, so state, action, reward, and state. Um, so the replay buffer is just going to be a list of these things. Uh, and so it might be nice to organize this better. Um, so let's make a data class. How's the um, sheltering in place or quarantine has been for people? Life going normal, drastic changes, everybody doing okay? So let's just say, I'm just going to call it SARS for now. And this has the state, which is uh, state action, which let's say int for now, not that it matters. Uh, reward, which is Let's, let's say it's a float. The food is getting monotonous. What food are you eating? Um, and then next state. Next state is important, as we'll see in a second. OK, so this basic uh, data class should suffice. And so we can now create the replay buffer. Um, Self uh, and yeah, we just want to give it the size, right? So buffer size. Oh, we can give it a default. So I think a hundred thousand tends to be a good option, especially for small problems. So self dot buffer size equals. What am I doing? Um, buffer size. So the the point of the replay buffer is that as um, as you add more samples to it, once it gets full, the old samples 
start getting pushed back. Um, oh, restaurants are closed. Where where are you at, Manas? Of what, what country? Uh, yeah, so replay buffer, you add more samples to the replay buffer and they get uh, they get pushed out once the old samples get pushed out once the buffer is full. So there's a few different ways of implementing this, the sort of the laziest way, and that's what I'm going to do tonight because it is it is midnight where I am. I, I don't want to do anything fancy. Oh, I see. I didn't realize restaurants and fast food chains were closed in India. That I mean, I guess it makes sense, but it's also... Michael, we're going to use the DQ method. <laughs> I was just getting to that. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm being lazy. Uh, I guess I don't have to. We can do something worse than DQ. Let's do something worse than DQ. Um, let's just use an array. <laughs> and let's add an insert method. Um, give it a bird flu. Um, and then we'll do self.buffer.append and then the real cringy stuff. Uh, what would it be? It would be negative uh, self.buffer size. Yeah. The height of efficiency. This is terrible. Never ever do this, but I think for a simple problem it's fine. Uh, typically, uh, people use uh, Python DQ, which is a linked list, so it's not um, it's not inefficient in insertion. So th this th th there's like a dichotomy here, right? So if you're using a list or just an array, right? It's, it's just a dynamic array. Uh, the insertion is order one, um, but you are essentially um, destroying the old array and making a new array every time you do this insertion and sort of push elements out, right? So, so the insert operation is not very efficient, but if you use a DQ, which is a, which is a doubly linked list, <coughs> the insert is always fast, but when you want to sample, that's slow. So it's, Pick your poison. Um, I, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are faster implementations. Um, one could probably do this really well with a with a database, and have it be more efficient than these methods. But I think for a simple problem for learning and toy problems, this is fine. Okay, so we'll do insert, and then uh, we should do the sample here. I think so. So let's do. Just sample, and then unknown samples. And here we probably should put an assert. Uh, minus the pop would still be at zero. So that actually would be even less efficient because every single pop would make a copy, right? So, well, uh, Actually, yeah, in this case, because we're only adding a single example, it would be the same. As, uh, this Doing this is the same as doing the pop zero, I think, because the pop zero is going to shift everything, so it's essentially copying the pointers. All right, so we want to assert that the samples that we're requesting um, are less than, or I suppose less than or equal to, the objects that we currently have in the buffer. And then I think we can just use the uh, the random module has a sample method, so we can just use that. So return sample self dot buffer. Yeah. Um, let me make sure this is correct. I 
like on sample random dot sample function. Yeah, that that looks to be correct. Cool. All right. Okay. So we got a replay buffer. So let's do some tests with the replay buffer. <coughs> so we got the environment, we got the observation. Um, I'm going to change this so that it's no longer a for loop, but is a while loop. So while true, yeah, if I want to render the environment, but take a random action. Get the observation reward and done. <coughs> and the info. And if done, then reset the environment. Um, da -da -dum. Now we'll get to it. Let's make sure we can interrupt this. So accept keyboard interrupt, I think. So now, in a while loop, we're going to take these random actions, create these, and OK. So let's make a replay buffer. And let's start inserting data to it. So rb dot insert self and how did we define SARS? Okay, so it needs to take the state, which is the, that's the last observation. So we always need to hang on to the last observation. Yeah. Last observation, the action that was taken, the reward that we got, and then the current observation, and then we update. Okay, cool. All right, so let's run this, and then if then rp.buffer is greater than, let's say, 10,000. Let's drop down into an IPDB. OK, and then we'll examine our objects and uh, make sure things are as we expect them to be. Observation is not defined. Oh, why am I? I don't need to be running that right now. All right, let's go. Also, because I didn't say 10,000, I said 100,000. My bad. Yeah, let's just do like 5,000. There we go. So, rb.buffer zero. Okay. So, we're now keeping these objects. 
we're holding on to the rewards. Um, that was a terrible idea. I just wanted to see one where uh, done was equal to true. So zero, the state was this guy. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure next state here is the same as the previous state here. Um, for the perceptive in the audience, you might be thinking, hey, isn't this, uh, isn't this a little inefficient because you're storing the same pointer twice? And yes, it is, but it makes the design of the replay buffer a little bit simpler. And we're only replicating the pointer, so it's not too bad. It's like eight bytes, whatever. Um, especially when you're storing images, I don't think really it matters at that point. Okay, so I think this is fine. Um, cool. All right, so we got that. Oh, one thing, um, we'll implement that later. But we're we're gonna once we get to training, we're gonna be we're gonna want to look at some metrics. And one of the metrics that's very interesting is to look at the average score of some number of recent examples. So that can be like average score of the last hundred samples that we have, and that's useful to monitor to see if uh, the model's making any progress. Um, we'll we'll get to that. Um, We'll need to have like a similar sample method that just gets the last 100, or we can just do it manually. We'll, we'll get to it. Okay, cool. So we got, I would say we have the replay buffer. I haven't checked, it'll work. I haven't checked that it uh, works correctly after it's filled, but like this is simple. Okay, so now that we have that, um, we can actually maybe forgo Epsilon Greedy for now and just have the model learn from... Um, oh, no, because then we can't monitor it necessarily. It's okay. We can still monitor the loss. So let's let's have the model learn from completely random, um, completely random actions and observations and see how it behaves. We do want the target model and we do need the training step. So, so we need an optimizer, and I always forget. Um, so let's look at let's look at the optimizer example again from PyTorch, or the training example. Oh, there we go. So, criterion, we're going to build it, build the loss ourselves. Uh, we just need the optimizer. So, torch.optim. Um, and I like to just embed the optimizer into the model. Uh, we can use Adam and a learning rate of uh, 1e negative 4 is usually fine for some of these. Okay, cool. Uh, yes, Manas, that's, uh, that, that's fine. Um, I, I do want the replay buffer to be large. 100,000 is a good sort of, I guess, good default number to start with. It can, it can be changed later or after testing. Okay, so we got the optimizer, and now we need to do the actual loss calculation and, and uh, backwards pass, right? So we can just define um, train step. Okay, so this is where I also kind of forget some things. So let's look at, whenever I'm trying to refresh my memory, I'd like to go to this, um, 
the set of slides from David Silver um, from DeepMind. And right now I just want to look at the um, the loss equation for DQN to jog my memory. Mm, there we go. Okay, so the Bellman equation being that the, the Q value of some state S and some action A is equal to um, the expectation of uh, the reward that you got from taking that action in that state plus some discount factor. We haven't discussed that yet. I don't think we really need to pay any mind to that for the simple example. And the max over the Q value of the of the next state and whatever max actions that you'd have. So this this constitutes the the loss. Now, um, oh right. So the train step really can't be. Oh no, it can be. It can be. It's fine. Um, this constitutes the loss. Uh, what we're gonna do uh, is uh, the this evaluation. Uh, this needs to come from a separate model, a fixed model. So we need to essentially create two instances of model. So there's model and then um, we need to create the same thing again. Um, and um, should it be a copy? I think it does need to be a copy in the beginning, and then in the future we're also need to make copies. So I actually need to look up how to copy parameters from one model to another in PyTorch. Copying weights from one net to another. Uh, Michael, I switched to PyTorch because I found I found it a lot simpler to represent some of the reinforcement learning ideas in PyTorch. So I'm, I only use PyTorch these days for RL. For everything else, I'm still using Keras. Um, one of the very nice things about PyTorch is that there's no additional abstractions, at least, to, at least visible to you. So in TensorFlow 2, it's a really nice API, and you can do things like um, put, well, that's a good idea, Menace. Um, Oh, that's literally what this says. <laughs> okay. Uh, to finish the thought on PyTorch versus TensorFlow. In TensorFlow, like if I have a train function and I put the decorator on it, like at, you know, TF function or whatever, um, then if I want to debug that, all of a sudden I have to deal with this sort of compiled down form, which is representing the, the underlying graph, which it, it, a lot of... It, it adds more pain um, without necessarily adding any real other benefits. Um, and I wanted to learn PyTorch anyway. So for for all intents and purposes for reinforcement learning, I'm just currently sticking with PyTorch. Uh, it's also nice uh, with some of the some of the policy gradient methods. Uh, you it's it's a nice abstraction to have uh, categorical or normal distributions. And in PyTorch, those are implemented already in a way that they're differentiable, so you can do a backwards pass through them. In TensorFlow, they're not, and so you essentially have to write your own, which is, it's a pain. So I hope that gives a good context to that. Okay, so TGT, we want to copy the parameters from M. Um, that's a good question, and Cap. Let's actually take a tiny detour for that. So first of all, this tutorial is really, really good. Um, I highly recommend if you're interested in reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning that you read through this. Um, it's pretty approachable and it's, it's pretty detailed. Then, if you go to YouTube, there is a lecture series from David Silver, again. Um, and it's also pretty detailed, and it goes into a lot of uh, a lot of theoretical context for reinforcement learning. This is also a good one. Uh, and then there's a bunch of recommendations. So it's not deep reinforcement learning, but 
there's a book that you can get for free uh, from Sutton and Bardo. And this is the sort of the definitive text. I actually haven't read this. I'm, I'm starting now. Uh, but it, it's people say that this is like a good, good book to learn general reinforcement learning as well as the historical context for it. And then a final book that I spent a fair amount of time with um, is this book from uh, Max Lapin. Uh, deep reinforcement learning hands-on there's like a 2020 edition that just recently came out uh, this is the old one i think um, this is the new one um, this is focusing on pytorch and it is focusing on everything being hands-on so it's actually a little bit light on theory but it's a really good book um, both has a quick reference as well as sort of just going through some of these algorithms and and breaking them down um, but yeah so and then i'm trying to build up a definitive set of tutorials. We'll we'll see how that ends up. I hope that was helpful in terms of sort of where to go for resources. All right, target model, uh, copying weights. Let's do this. So tgt dot load state dict, and then um, m dot state dict. Okay, cool. So we're actually going to need to do this step a fair amount of time, so maybe we should just make a function for it. Cool. All right. So training step we still don't have the training step i'm kind of starting to give up on the abstractions that i was setting up um eh, no not entirely okay so to run the train step we're gonna have we're gonna have a list of sample state transitions with rewards oh you know what i forgot uh, done. So it's not SARS, it's SARS D. Um, uh, done, I believe, is important. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, done is important. Done is important because going back to, well, I don't, I close the slides, but um, when we look at the, the max possible reward in the future, so look at the Q value from the future, given the next observation, if the, if the episode had ended, then that's zero. Um, so, or yeah, that's zero. That, that part is zero. The reward is the only thing that remains. So done is important. I totally forgot about that. Okay, so train step. Um, we get um, state transitions. Let's just call them that for now. Um, I think that's it. Okay, so here we need to create our... Yeah, so first off. we need to create our state vector. And that's just gonna be stacked. So, um, cur states equals torch dot stack. Um, and then we'll say s dot state for s in state transitions, right? Uh, we need the rewards. Terrible idea. And this gets going to be reward for S and state transitions. Um, I could be fancy with it here, but whatever. Let's see. So we need the current states. We need the rewards. Um, We need to know, we, we need like a mask for when they're done. So 
Um, so the, the mask is just going to be one if you weren't done and then zero if you were done. And you'll see in a second why. So torch.stack is going to be not s.done, but it's going to be one if s.done else. No, zero if s.done else one. for s and state transitions. Okay. And then we need the next states, right? So torch stack s dot next state for s and state transitions. Um, s a r actions. Forgot about the actions. Um, do actions matter here? forgot if actions matter. I think they do. Uh, it went too far. Yeah, but the model is not, it's only a function of the state. Oh, right, because it's gonna, yeah, of course actions matter. Um, just, to, just to give context here, uh, I wasn't sure if actions mattered for the loss function calculation, um, but they do. So the, the loss function is built by essentially trying to ensure that the Bellman equation is consistent. So this, you, you want to minimize this difference, right? And this is the right-hand side of the Bellman equation, which is the reward, which we have now in array four, and then uh, the max over the Q values for the next state. Um, so this here, we're just taking the max over the action dimension, um, but then we're subtracting from it the Q value um, for our state given a particular action. So this is actually picking um, the Q value. I should have remembered this because when I was trying to implement this in Keras, that was, this was actually a major, major pain point. Um, so I don't know why I forgot that. Maybe I blocked the memory out. Okay, cool. So actions do matter and we need to make that. Really? So S dot action for s and six transitions okay so we got the actions so we got all of this um, now to compute the loss we need to take our rewards uh, add to it I'm not gonna bother with the discount factor just yet if uh, if I fall flat on my face we'll figure it out then so So we need to be a little bit careful here. Um, so, okay, we need to compute the Q values from the target model. Ah, see? Um, this guy needs to be a separate function. Mana is not for each action. Basically, you can only compute, you can only um, ensure consistency for the Bellman equation for the actions that you actually did take. So that, that's why the actions are necessary. So model, state transition, and target model. Okay, so with torch, um, dot no grad I believe because we're not uh, we don't want to do any backwards passes on the target model 
um, we need to compute the Q values for the next state. So Q vals next equals just target model and pass it next states. And we need to take the max over the action dimension. So the, the output of this would be Uh, that would be a shape n and then the q valve, which is num actions, right? So let's just take the max here. Cool. So we got that piece. Um, we have the rewards. So the loss would be computed by taking the rewards, adding to them q valves next and then subtracting from it the the curse state. So this is this is where we do actual forward pass. So this is going to be the model and we pass through it the current states. And then we subtract from here the Q values. Um, No, 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 uh, right. So the, we, we got the Q values, right? And this is of shape N and then new actions. But we need to pick only the Q values for the actions that were chosen. And I think I need to do one hot here. Um, Yeah. Which means that I need to know the number of factions. Okay. Let's see. So um, I might need to test this in an IPython session. Torch dot and end dot one hot and end dot functional dot one hot. Yes. Okay. And one hot is done with the tensor or just an array, I think. So one, two, three. And then number of actions, just five, I guess. Nope, needs to be a tensor. One hot is only applicable to index tensor, right? I think I can say long tensor. There we go. Okay. So the idea then is that I can compute this one hot tensor, multiply it with the Q values, and then sum those along along the action dimension. And that gives me just the Q values for Yeah. I could have also done that in a loop, but this is obviously more efficient. Okay, so one hot actions um, torch dot long tensor. Oh, um, I wonder if that's gonna work because I've also already done so torch dot stack right. Yeah, so let's, for actions, I can't stack. I just have to get the list. Okay. And then we can do here, we can do Q vals times one hot actions, which should both have the same shape. torch.sum. Let's try this here. So torch.sum uh, 
Um, what do I want to do it? Right, is that correct? Was it three? Yeah, it was three actions. Cool. Whoops. Seriously. I have to restart my editor here. And then we want to take a mean of all of this. So the total loss then is that. Okay, so once that is done, actually before that is done, I think we need to do optimizer.0 grad. Do we? Yeah, grad before we do a forward pass here. So model dot optimizer dot zero grad. And then we take a step. So model dot optimizer. No, we do it backwards. So loss dot backwards and then optimizer dot step. And then let's return the loss from this so that we can track it. Okay, so that's our train step. Um, let's actually try this. So we have everything there. Um, missing one required positional argument params. Oh, totally forgot. Um, the optimizer needs to know about your model. Where did I define that? Here. So self dot parameters, I believe. Can I just do it like that? Um, it's a function. There we go. Um, it's, it can actually just be self.net.parameters. Since all of our complexity is inside this one object. Cool. Okay. So ran this through the IPDB. Um, so we can now try calling the train step function and see how that works. But can't get help on this. All right, so it needs to take the model. All right, it needs to the state transitions, which are just going to be a sample from the replay buffer. Let's say a sample of 5,000. Um, we need the target model and then the number of actions, which Let's say two for now. Replay buffer object has no attribute buffers. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I never tested the sample function. There we go. Uh, let's set uh, the actual training up here. Model uh, rb dot sample. And let's say, yeah, let's say 1,000 for the sake of argument. And then and dot action space dot n. Okay, and let's put the IPDB inside here because I want to make sure that each one of these steps is actually going correct. Expected tensor as element zero in argument zero. Right, because torch can only stack tensors. I should have seen that coming. Um,
Oh, it's good that we did this because I just realized I didn't use the masks. Okay, so this equation is wrong because QVAL's next needs to be zero when the game had ended, so that it needs to be multiplied by the masks. There, that's better. Okay, so let's try this again. Um, argument tensors position one must be a tuple of tensors, not tensor. Uh, really? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Really? I feel like I'm doing this wrong. There's definitely better ways of doing this. All right, 1,000 is the batch mention. Four is the size of the state. Great. Uh, new data must be sequence got float. Hmm. I guess we can't really have to be an array. Also, just a float. Okay. Rewards appear to be correct. Uh, one for the most part. Not seeing a single negative one. should make sure that this is correct in the replay buffer in a second. I'll definitely see that. Um, so that also means that mask is always going to be one because we don't have any example of a finished episode here, which is a little bit odd. Let's see, next states, um, actions. Oh, we haven't gotten there yet. Cool. Valves next. Oh, wait, what? Do it. Does this need to be evaluated in some way? Oh, Max is a tuple. Okay. Well, that's wrong. Um, we need the, the max values. We do not need the index. Uh, same needs to be applied somewhere else. Are we using max somewhere else? Yes, here. Here we need one. Okay, cool. Glad I caught that. Sh 
shape is 1000. This is not, this is going to run into a problem. Pretty sure. A uh, model object has no attribute optimizer because it's called opt. Received an invalid combination of arguments. Got list, int, but expected something else. All right, um, that was my mistake. There. Cool. I think I need to move that IP to be down a little. All right, let's continue debugging. Um, okay, so one of the things that always gets me is that there's often like a dimensions mismatch in these kind of calculations and they create incorrect values. So let's, let's make sure that that's not the case here. So rewards.shape 1001, mass.shape 1001, qvals next.shape 1000. So what happens when you multiply mask by qvals? We get 1002, how? Oh, QVALS next, not QVALS. We get 1000, 1000. This gets me every time. Um, the, I guess the few ways of fixing it is we just do mask this. That's probably the correct way to do it here. Okay, so that's an important change. And then um, Q valves has, have a shape of 1002, um, one hot. I just realized the terminal, I pushed it out. One hot actions has a shape of 1002. So this, this works fine. We just multiply it by one hot actions, um, but then we need to sum it. And that's gonna be in the negative one direction, right? And the shape of that is 1000. So that's fine. That's consistent. Um, so I think we're good. So we can just print, print the loss here. And quit. Let's just make sure. Oh. Uh, I think it's just backward, not backwards. Cool. We got a loss. Okay, so before complicating things any further, let's make sure. So what, what we're going to do is we are going to... Let's see. So let's add some some constraints here. So minimum min RB size, let's say is five thousand, right? Or no, let's say it's ten thousand. And then for each epoch we're gonna do um, sample size equals 5,000, right? Um, and then we should be tracking things as a function of number of steps played. Um, we don't necessarily want to do an update every single step. So bef actually before this, um, Besides, oh yeah, so the only only do training once the buffer is big enough, right? Um, and then the other thing is that we don't want to train on every single step, so we need to figure out how many steps 
we want to run um, uh, 10,000, 5,000. So let's do, let's do 5,000 steps in the environment. No, that's maybe too much. Let's do 1,000 steps in the environment uh, before doing the next step of training. So end steps before train equals 1,000. And we can, we can tweak these later, depending on how things are working. <laughs> okay, so if length of RB.buffer buffer is greater than min RB size, we do this, but there's a second test here. Um, yes, yeah, so let's do steps since train equals zero, right? And every time we're going to add to that. Right. And then if and step since train is greater than um, and steps before train, then do this. And then just set steps since train equals zero. Okay. Um, and we can. Um, And we can just pr print out the lost loss for now um, alongside. Oh yeah, we should also be we should also be tracking environment steps. Um, and let's actually do um, negative one times min RB size because I don't know, otherwise it would just be weird. So step num plus equals one. Um, and then here we can print the step number as well. So we're not really doing any, um, excuse me. Ah. Sorry about the sound. getting sleepy and kicking things. All right, so we're not really doing any target model update yet. Um, we're just gonna make sure that the loss behaves in the way that we would expect it. So right now we have a fixed model and a model that we're training. And so over time, the loss should start, um, start decreasing, All right? So let's just run this and see if that's actually the case. Okay, yeah, so it looks like it is. Loss is steadily going down. Now this means nothing. Um, that's kind of funny. I feel like it's actually slowing down a little bit and that's very likely to be because of the insertion time being stupid. Okay. I think we can fix that, but uh, we'll come back to it. Okay, all of this is still happening on the CPU. Um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna try to tackle uh, the GPU bit tonight or not. Okay, so we can do, actually before we do anything, uh, I do wanna set up a little bit of visibility. Uh, I've been using this um, service called Weights and Biases. That's that's been very helpful in tracking some of these agents. So let's go initialize and so the project here is DQN tutorial and the name is uh, DQN. 
card pull. Okay. And for now, the only thing that we would log is just loss. I'm going to decrease some of these numbers and because I feel like maybe things would go a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. Zero. Right. Um, so we want to log the loss. So when dp dot log. And then step is equal to step num. Do we want to log anything else? No, I think we're fine. Um, so we're training, let's see, every 100 steps, we're training on 2,500 samples. And then let's say every 5,000 steps, So in addition to steps since train, we're going to say steps since TGT. Let's do that here. So then we can say uh, target model update should happen after 50 epochs of training. I think that works. Okay. If steps since TGT is greater than target model update, then we do the update, pass it the model, the target model, and that's it, right? No, it's update TGT model. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Update TGT model, pass the model, pass the target, um, and then set uh, steps since TGT equals zero. And actually, instead of calling it steps, we can say epochs so that it's more clear. I'd also like to get some visual feedback on on the terminal. So let's get let's do this. Um, we'll get a get a TQDM instance, and then we'll just update it. Yeah, I could do the modulus. That's true. Okay, we got our progress bar. Let's go ahead and run this, see if it actually works. Oh, I'm still printing the loss. That's, I don't want that. We'll be able to see how the total speed of the algorithm evolves. Um, in the meantime, as it's training, let's go to weights and biases and open our project. So here's our current run, I believe. Let's make sure. Yes, this was the old one. I can delete that. 
Yeah, so these spikes in the loss. Are expected, though I didn't expect them to be this sharp. Um, but the spikes in the loss are going to happen because um, we we have been sort of fitting to a particular target model, and then we just change it, and then we fit to the this new target model, and then we change it, and we fit to the new target model, and we change it. <coughs> okay, so this is running at uh, about 500 iterations. Um, every second. What we're looking for, and I, I'd probably kill this pretty quickly afterwards, but what we're looking for initially is just to see if this overall trend and the loss starts to drop um, and sort of at what rate it starts to drop. There's also this uh, clothes iron icon for smoothing out your plots. So you can, I don't know, more clearly see the trends. So it, it is definitely going down. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. So that's that's a good sanity check. But we now need to start tracking. We need to start tracking the average reward. Um, And I guess oh and this is uh, the whole thing starting to slow down I want to replace the array with a DQ there's a reason for that. Um, we sample a lot less often than we insert. Um, so having insertion be heavy. The reason in slowing down Manas is that um, our insertion is getting slow in the replay buffer. Um, as the buffer expands in size, Adding every new item, which is which we do a lot, um, slows it down. So I'm going to replace the list with a DQ, and that should it'll still slow down because the samples are going to be slower. But we do the sample a lot less often, so it should slow down less. Let's find out. Um, actually, I don't remember. So let's Python DQ. This is how you spell DQ, kids. Apparently, collections. There we go. Okay, and I think it's max len is the argument. So, yeah, max len equals buffer size. <laughs> yeah, DQ is definitely better than list, at least in this particular example. Um, we'll find out, I suppose. I guess we know, right? Um, we can benchmark this. So this was starting to, it started at about 600 iterations per second and then went down to about 250. So we'll see how DQ does. Um, we no longer need to do the push. We just do the, we just do an append. Um, and the sample works the same because I think the interface for the DQ is the same as a list. So yeah, let's, let's run this again. So come back down to earth here. Um, let's rename this to uh, DQ. Loss dynamics should be roughly the same. I 
think I think I can add a plot for let's see. We can do a line plot between relative time and step, like maybe. No. Well that's sad. Thought I could. Yeah, so this hasn't really slowed down. Um, well, it's slowing down a little bit, but that's because of the sample, but it hasn't slowed down as much. So yeah, DQ wins. Hooray. Uh, let's do... Okay, all loss dynamics are the same. Things are running a little bit faster. I think if we went with GPU, it might run a little bit faster as well, but concerns for a future time. Um, we want to start tracking the reward. By resetting the environment, right? Um, we can actually... So at the moment, everything that we're doing is completely random, right? We're just sampling from the action space. So we could do one of two things. One is um, we can do the epsilon decay, right? And log the, log the average reward. Let's just do that. So value of epsilon, we'll start off with 1.0. Um, uh, eps min, we will say is 0 0.01. Um, and then eps decay. So we need to do a little bit of math here. Let's do some rough math. So we can we can do the decay. So if we raise this to yeah, so if we can do the we can do the decay by number of steps of the environment. So if we want the epsilon to decay, let's say in 250,000 steps, it should decay to its minimum value. Um, that, yeah, no. So we need a lot more nines here. Better. This is so scientific. Too, too much. There's a formula you can come up with this that I've done before, but I'm lazy right now. Um, I think this is fine. Yeah. We don't actually need to say max epsilon. Uh, so we can just use the decay as the stand in so nine 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 eight okay and then we can just say for at every update the actual epsilon value yeah so the absent the actual epsilon value is going to be equal to um, epsilon decay raised to Uh, step num yeah let's let's add the first five thousand and that's fine yeah and then we'll decide if we're 
sampling from the model or for sampling from the environment. So if um, so, from random import sample import uh, random as well. So if random is less than epsilon, right? Then we take the totally random action. Otherwise, we use the model. Um, and we need to pass it the last observation. No, wait. Um, this is why we made the agent class that we haven't used yet. We spent 15 whole minutes writing this. <laughs> um, this is ridiculous. Let's just, I'm not going to use that class. Uh, just call the model on the last observation and get that item. And that's going to be our action. Um, and then as we're doing this, we can also log our epsilon. Right? Okay. Is there anything else? Oh, rewards. Um, so as we're doing this, now it makes sense for us to be logging an average reward um, at the end of an episode. So we can just we can just keep a buffer, keep a rolling buffer here. So episode rewards. And then if it's done, then we'll say Every time we get a reward, we add it to the rolling reward. And when it's done, we add that to the episode rewards. And set the rolling reward to zero. And then when we do our update, we take the list of last rolling rewards. Um, And episode rewards, and then set episode rewards to an empty array. So much state flying around. Isn't it wonderful? OK, so I think we're set with everything. Um, just for the sake of um, for the sake of uh, testing potentially afterwards, let's save the model. So tgd dot uh, save, right? No. How do you save models? I always forget. Um, Saving and loading models. Save the state date. OK, give it a path. So um, we got the state dict. Uh, and then for path, let's just. Uh, um, let me make sure there's a folder for this, so I'm not just like crudding up stuff. Models, okay. And we can just say save it in models, uh, slash, and then whatever the step number was, dot pth. PTH is just the um, by convention what's used in PyTorch. Okay, so 
We're saving on every target model update. The models shouldn't be too big anyway. Uh, let's go ahead and run this, make sure it's uh, not crashing. It is crashing. And DRA has no object. Oh, uh, I need to make a tensor here. Uh, only one element tensors can be converted to Python scalars. Max. I didn't do a max. Max negative one. Negative one there. Yeah, looks like it's working. Okay. Nope. Wait. Oh, okay. That was just an update. All right, so we can go back to weights and biases. Um, we, we have a number of new runs now. Uh, we can go ahead and delete all of the ones except the latest one. Okay, cool. So loss is behaving as we expect it. Um, Epsilon is going down. This might be too aggressive. I guess we'll find out soon. Uh, the average reward is going down, so that's wonderful. Let's see if that starts going up. I think the Epsilon decay might be a little too aggressive. Thank you for your kind words, Romain. Okay. So this is not particularly encouraging at the moment. This tells me something's wrong. Oh my god, I totally forgot. <laughs> so the loss should not should not go negative. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> the loss function's wrong. Okay. Um <laughs> we squared this before we mean this. Um, yeah, so this, this this is done as an MSC, and I wasn't squaring it, so it was uh, yeah, that's that's bad. We don't we don't want to do that. So that's completely wrong. Uh, let's go ahead and stop this run. Um, so that should help maybe improve things, but I think I still think the. The epsilon decay is more aggressive than I wanted it to be. Um, so let's make it a little bit slower and run this again. Yeah, we're we're in the waiting and debugging part of uh, reinforcement learning, which is painful. Okay, a little bit better epsilon decay. Let's go ahead and hide the that last run.
I am currently ignoring the discount factor, Manas. Um, I kind of wanted to see how this would behave without it. Um, this is this is a finite time game. It's not uh, it's not that many steps, so I feel like it should be fine without it. But if if this continues failing, we'll we'll add one. Oh look, the loss is going up. So there's also a number of other things that we could be considering here. Um, so let's talk through some of the hyperparameters. Here, so I may be training too often or I may be training not as often as I need to, right? So that's that's one thing to consider. Another one is target model update. Um, I'm currently doing it after 5,000 steps. Um, so it's like after 50 uh, batches, but uh, sometimes it's a better idea to, to wait longer for the target model. So let's nix this because this isn't actually going anywhere. And that the loss just keeps increasing, uh, and that this this actually does make a little bit of sense. Um, uh, I would wager that the loss is probably going to increase like this for a while and then start coming down. But the average reward situation does not inspire confidence in in that idea. Um, and this is the reason I. I yeah. Oh yeah, there's a lot of hyperparameters. So one one of the things to consider about the loss is that we're we're trying to train a neural net right now that's essentially trying to predict kind of large numbers, um, and that's not necessarily always very good. Um, so what 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 is the maximum length of this episode? Episode length is greater than 200. So 200 is the max that it can be, right? Um, this means that at, at time step zero, we're trying to train a network to predict a, um, to predict the number 200, right? Um, to basically say, if you take this action, then the max reward that you can expect is gonna be 200. Discount factor can actually be helpful here, Manas, right, from, from that perspective. Uh, but even without that, I think that um, I think that it might be beneficial for us to um, to scale the reward down, right? So divide it by 100, let's say. We can do that after we add it to the rolling reward so that we can still see that value correctly. Um, but we divide it by 100 to maybe help normalize it. Consider solve when the average reward is greater than or equal to 195 over 100 consecutive trials. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So we got that. And then what was the other thing that I was thinking of? Oh, uh, update rate. So instead of doing every 50 batches, um, we can do every 150 and see if that makes a change. All right. So like good scientists, we're going to change two variables and see what happens. Okay, 
uh, I kind of have to hide this now because that loss value is so different from the old one. Okay. And now we wait. So the loss is not bouncing as much. And I think the two reasons for that, one of them is just that we normalized. Um, and then the second one is the slower update of the target model. Yeah, I saw the spike. I I wouldn't put much stock in it. Oh, I would put stock in this. See that knee? That that little bit of a an increase. One one of the things uh, we're gonna get philosophical here, I guess. But one of the things that is really it's not just a problem with reinforcement learning, it's a problem with neural nets as well, but as soon as you start plotting your metrics, sometimes you'll just watch your metrics <laughs> for a long time. And that gives you a feeling of being productive, but it's actually just, you know, it's just, under normal circumstances, I would just close this window and come back. Yeah. Not an hour. Uh, I mean, if this upward trend continues, um, that implies some learning. So let's see. It's been about 180, so about three minutes, right? So this decay implies it's going to get um, maybe in 10 to 15 minutes, the epsilon should have decayed very close to zero. Um, by the time it starts reaching like 20%, um, or even 40%, this trend is going to become more pronounced, right? Um, so we shouldn't have to wait too long, and we can potentially just interrupt this and write a test as well. And that that would be a good um, a good end to the stream in running a test. Where it's going to get more interesting is uh, in something like Breakout or Pong, um, because anytime you're throwing convolutional nets into the mix, uh, things get a lot slower. Yeah, it does seem like it's working, but I want to give it a little bit more time, get the epsilon to decay further.
All right, it's getting close to the max score. Wait, it shouldn't be going above 250, though. What? I wonder if something's broken again. Because I don't think it should be... Unless this is... What version is this? V1, right? Oh, this is V1. 500. It's not 200, it's 500. Excellent. So yeah, I'll let this go for another few minutes and then stop it and write. Well, we can start writing the test while this is training. Um. Do this really lazily. Let's let this run. Uh, let's write a very, very quick test so we can visualize some of these before finishing the stream. Um, so if test equals true, then we don't want uh, don't want a target model. <coughs> well, actually, it doesn't matter. I can still leave that. We just don't want the update step, right? And we want the epsilon to be so if test, then epsilon is just zero, right? Um, also, if a checkpoint is passed, then you should load. How do you load? Load state dick torch dot load okay. Um, so this is if uh, checkpoint is not none, then load it and pick the so yeah epsilon should be zero if it's test. Um, I don't care if we keep inserting this. Uh, I think that's fine too. Uh, all the all the weights and biases stuff should be disabled. And yeah, and then no training. So if um, not test and okay. So yeah, no training, no anything. Um, I guess we can print the print the rolling reward. So if test print. And then if this is a test, then you should render. So and I would sleep a little bit as well. So 0 0.01 or something. Um, 0 0.5. It's what? 20? No, not 20. Uh, it's like 
200 frames a second. That's maybe too fast. Um, no, what am I saying? 20 frames a second. Okay, um, going back to weights and biases. This is a little discouraging. It's like uh, degrading in performance all of a sudden. But it's also relying more and more on the model now. Um, so it should maybe continue to increase. Um, we can still run a test though. So we've been saving the model, hopefully. Here. Now uh, we can go by modify time. God, I hate gnome so much. Can I move this? Ah, just come on. Whatever. Um, so here's one that we can load that I think is recent. I realize it wasn't clearing this directory between runs, so this might have some crud from past runs. Okay, so. Work on RL. Oh, and gonna be lazy again and say test equals true just here. And then uh, give it the checkpoint, so models. So it is kind of biased, kind of pushing it to the to the side. So yeah, like it's keeping it balanced. It's getting high score, um, but it does keep kind of pushing it to the side. It's not very stable. Um, but progress started to learn. Um, Let's see. I don't think the spike really meant a lot. I mean, it was still a combination of randomness in the model. Um, but we can try to find the weights around that time. So this was... This was about 200,000. So I think this file order... This file is probably representative of it. <laughs> yeah, it's not that much better actually much worse. Okay. <clears throat> All right, it's also not um it's not actually improving anymore. Um, the average reward is starting to suffer more and more over time. Um, so this is roughly, so we, we got to a point where some stuff started to work, right? Uh, I'm gonna stop the stream here. We can run a test with this as well. So there's like the latest weights. Yeah, it's just kind of biased towards going to the left there. Um, yeah. Yeah, 
so I'm going to stop the stream now. Um, some of the things, of course, is one of the things that could potentially help this over time is um, the, there, there's a few different things. One is the epsilon value could be decayed a lot slower, slower than what we have now. Um, two, the um, um, the scaling that we did, um, we can we can change it a little bit because um, loss being this small, um, I I think this can potentially impact um, the gradients that we're seeing. So it could it could have drastically slowed down learning. Um, so that's something to check. So those are the two things that I can think of to to tinker with. Anyways, um, yeah. So. Uh, thanks everybody for joining, uh, and especially thanks to the three people that stayed throughout. Um, I will try to schedule more follow-up streams. Um, I'm going to spend some time sort of off-camera looking through uh, some of the hyperparameter stuff here, and then in the next stream we can sort of start with a discussion of that uh, and talk through potentially more results, and then move on to uh, trying to trying to apply this to something like breakout and uh yeah look at look at sort of the, some of the functional differences between doing this with a very very simple model versus a, a relatively complex one um so thanks again everybody for joining and uh until next time bye <laughs>